Hello, I'm Chrissy Seaton. Welcome to my channel. Today we are commencing a new series and that is going to be a series on the Book of Job. Now, the Book of Job, apart from being one of my favourite fascinations in the biblical writings, the Book of Job is a book for all times and all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. And it's also an often overlooked or misunderstood book. And let's not forget, it is a book full of questions. So we're going to go through some of those things that have questioned us at times. Some of you may be familiar with the book of Job. Some of you might have started reading it and thought, this is, you know, I'm just not following this or... And this is what we're going to try and dispel in this series. So this video today is actually called Job an Overview. So we're really just looking at some things that are going to help us understand the writings and perhaps give us some um, confidence in going ahead and having an in-depth look in some areas, an in-depth look at the book of Job. So let's get underway. Well, many people are, are, often will say, oh, life isn't fair. No, it's not fair. And a statement such as this, we are told by the um, sages and um, the holy uh, rabbinical uh, great scholars, etc., that if we say this, that that's that's half a step away from heresy, uh, even blasphemy, and um, because we, we, when we say life isn't fair, then what we're actually saying is God, Hashem, is not fair. Our Creator isn't fair. Now we know that that's not correct, or we should understand that that is not correct. Because everything that Hashem does is calculated with decision and fine detail. It's not just something that randomly takes place or, or like the flip of a coin, for instance. It's not um, a random occurrence. And it, it all comes back to God's divine and wise providence that we benefit from each day. Now... Um, we've got here that um, Rambam begins an introduction to the book of Job and he says that it's this essential principle of faith. Creator um, deserves and observes and supervises human beings, uh, whether they do good or whether they do evil, um, whether they should attain success uh, and fulfilment or perhaps pain and misfortune or a mishap. And he goes on further to explain that anyone who claims uh, that whatever happens to that person is, um, uh, is just a, a painful or it's a mishap. And th what they're saying is that that is just like the flip of a coin, that what, that, situation they find themselves in, be it physical or spiritual. Um, and, and there's what they're saying is it's not because of the will and the intent of our divine Father Hashem, the Creator. So to say those things, to say that it's just, oh, it's just, you know, flip of a coin, um, that's heretic. And um, those people if they continue to behave that way or think that way, they're not, we're told, they're not going to have a share in the world to come. Now, Rambam also goes on and makes a couple of points, two fundamental points, actually. Number one, that God is aware of everything, absolutely aware of everything, and he rewards and punishes accordingly to what our deeds are. So whatever our actions or interventions are they're judged they're either judged favorably or they're judged to be not correct 
Um, and we know with certainty that um, he willed it to be and that uh, he had a constructive and merciful purpose uh, in doing what he did and doing it that way, in other words. So most people, um, unfortunately, they look at their life as a succession of natural or random happenings and uh, they don't apply any acknowledgement at all that it is that Hashem is involved in this or the master of this indeed. Uh, now we see that becoming alarmingly increased in recent modern times where we see that, um, you know, uh, things like taking prayer, morning prayer out of church, out of schools, pub, certain schools. Um, there's um, all this, uh, how shall I say, um, people changing their genders, uh, either surgically or otherwise. There's uh, all manner of things going on. And sometimes at the end of the day, one just thinks what more can happen? What, how crazier can the world get? There's no, um, how shall I say, conscious thought in, the, in some people that there is a heavenly father. There is a heavenly um, court that we have to answer for one way or the other. So we'll move along here now. Um, so when these um, unexpected um, elections happen, the outcome might be not what we thought. There might be an economic catastrophe or you could have medical results you didn't anticipate. Um, that should serve to tell us that we're actually not in control and that there's a higher power directing that. Now, I know recently in some elections, the United States, for instance, um, it, that was a surprise result that I don't think a lot of people were expecting. I'm not getting into politics here, but we have to understand when it seems that the obvious may happen and it doesn't, then we have to think that, well, after all, Hashem is in charge of everything. So, um, so what we have to learn to do is, is how shall I say, scrutinise our perception of things and things aren't always as we um, attribute things to be. There's another reason. And I've often said in previous videos, you know, when you go out in the morning to get in your car to go to work and you're already running late and you've got a flat tyre. Now, we should be saying, thank you, Hashem, for the flat tyre. It's only going to make me late for work, but it may be preventing me from a, a nasty um, incident or something like that. There's a reason why I got a flat tyre, Hashem. I thank you for it and I will manage. So we need to just understand that. Things just don't randomly happen. And we can't ascribe them to just normal casual events that happen. And that's be wrong and foolish. And um, it, uh, it's been, it, Rambam has suggested that that is actually cruel. Um, he, he says that um, if you don't acknowledge that it was God who brought um, about a tragedy, a punishment or a mishap or, you know, a loss of some funds or something like that, then, you know, we're liable to be punished just for that reason, that we didn't acknowledge that it, it, it's often a hidden blessing, a hidden blessing, and we have to understand that. Um, and, and when um, we refuse to recognise the hand of Hashem, what we're actually doing is um, we're displaying or, or advertising an attitude that actually prevents us and others from true repentance and returning to God. So God controls the world, although that's not always obvious. Um, people tend to think that God stepped in in major events like, for instance, an example given here is that uh, when the 10 plagues were, came upon Egypt or when the, um, the parting of the seas, the Sea of Reeds, we expect God's intervention to be a big fanfare, a big production, 
but we fail to understand that, you know, every tiny infinitesimal thing that happens in our life is still under the production and execution of Hashem. So it's, these aren't random events. Um, uh, I, I guess what we're saying is that, that there's no difference between the splitting of the sea and sending an ordinary rain shower. God, this it's effortless for Hashem to do that. So um, if we saw the splitting of the sea, we'd say, oh, what a miracle if we'd been there. Uh, if we're out gathering the washing and a rain shower comes over, we don't. We just think that's a rain shower. We don't attribute that also to God, just as the splitting of the sea was. Um, we also don't understand that um, he controls all things and their sins for which the punishment um, is death at the hands of heaven. Yes, death at the hands of heaven. And we may not understand or know that, but God will impose a death penalty from heaven. And that could be something as simple as um, somebody uh, died of a terrible uh, gastro bug or something like that. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen very often. People, medications are so good today, but let's just suppose it happened. Then, you know, he had to get the bug. How did that come about? So God knows everything that goes on. He can execute it or prevent it. And so very often what seems to be a purely natural death, we don't know. It could have been uh, um, ordained by God at that particular time. So either it be, you know, um, an illness or an accident, something like that. But natural deaths do come under that category as well. It's not, we tend to think more about perhaps an accident or being saved from an accident and things like that. But there's also what we call natural causes of death that are still under the hand of Hashem. He still rules those things. Even things like... Uh, if you have a really good crop of grain, oh, you think, oh, gee, the rain came, this came, we've had a bumper crop, they'll call it. That's a, a, a very common expression in Australia. Well, yes, you have had a bumper crop, and yes, the rains came and helped it, but how do you think the rain came? You know, it wasn't the rain that caused the bumper crop. It was Hashem who sent the rain who made your crop an excellent um, crop to harvest. And um, so, you know, we, we, we have to be mindful of that absolutely everything is ordained by Hashem. Um, so let's move on a little bit more. Um, when we look at the book of Job, and so, as I said, some of you may have read it several times or studied it several times, and some of you may not because of varying reasons. But um, we have to realise, first of all, a couple of fundamental things. And firstly, um, that we know that Job was a truly righteous and good man. Um, at chapter one of Job, we see God testifies to this and um, to the angels that Job is incomparably righteous. So that's a statement. Um and uh, when it goes on um, a little bit further in this book, which I'll mention to you shortly that I'm using, um, further down, we could talk about that in uh, three of history's greatest Zadikim, that is holy people, righteous, truly, you know, God's got his thumb on them, so to speak. Um, and these three righteous people, or Zadikim, I wonder if you can guess who those three people were. Well, I won't keep you in suspense. One was Noah, one was Daniel, and the other was Job. Now let that sink in. Noah and Job were not Jews, they were Gentiles. 
So clearly God testified to this and said that Job was the prototype of righteousness. So this is really something that we need to understand as well. Um, and the sages explain why um, Ezekiel, in, in the book of Ezekiel, and that came under um, Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14, um, each of them saw the cycle of a world in bloom, a world destroyed, and a world restored to its prior eminence. So they, that, that's fascinating, isn't it? You, you stop and think about it. Um, and Noah saw his entire world destroyed. I'm reading this verbatim now here. Noah saw his entire world destroyed in the deluge and then saw it re-inhabited and rebuilt. Daniel experienced the holiness of the temple and then he was exiled to Babylon and learned of its destruction. He then lived to see the Jewish people return to the land to build a second temple. Job had honour, wealth, family and prestige and then he was left with nothing but poverty, pain and friends who accused him of being a sinner who deserved every iota of his suffering. But he survived and was restored not only to his eminence but to be told by God himself that his friends were wrong and he was righteous. So we should remember this. We should remember it and we need to study um, the book and learn about Job's insistence that his suffering was unjust, etc. Because as we get to the end of it, um, he talks with God and that will... Um, that all unravels there that yes he was a righteous man he was a righteous man so we're going to go on here now and we talk about well was job truly great is he really a great man even though we've heard all this information okay so let's look at this um uh the satan Oh, some people say Satan, but the Satan, the prosecutor, he minimised the righteousness of Job and he protested and said, Job was a loyal, righteous servant of God. Why should he not be? And it goes on to say that Job was fabulously wealthy. He had fine family and lacked nothing. It's easy to be good and faithful if there are no challenges to faith. Let Job suffer calamitous losses, the Satan insisted, and let us see how faithful he will remain. He, uh, so he suffers horrific physical pain, yet what troubles him most, meaning Job, uh, is not the illness and the constant agony, but the challenge to his faith. That's what bothered Job most. And then we go on and we look at a bit more about the book of Job and it grapples with many things. So let's just say, and of course the question, the underlying question that everybody has at some stage in their life or um, in their family, they say, you know, similar to, well, why do, um, why do the righteous people suffer and uh, sinful people prosper. You know, people who are bad seems to be always doing okay and the really pious and genuine people, God-fearing people, uh, they seem to have one calamity after another happening to them. So what we're looking at here is, does God scrutinize creation and exercise control or has he removed himself and left destiny to the natural forces? Is man so trivial and God so lofty that he does not concern himself with earthly creatures? Is he even aware of the fate of his creations? Well, most of us would say that we know better than that. We know that God is in control. And we'll continue on here. So apparently after... Um, Job suffered all his losses, including his family, um, etc. His wife survived, but there, he, there, all sorts of things happened to him. But uh, and he he was in a very unfortunate state. But he had three friends that come to visit him, as friends do. Um, but and they all gave varying speeches. Um, I think they each gave three speeches or more. 
and um, their response instead of comforting poor Job who was you can imagine how he was feeling when he lost his children his livestock all his um, uh, wealth and he had a great amount of wealth um, and uh, and on top of that he was stricken with diseases and you know terrible skin irritation etc so you can imagine the state that Job was in and of course his friends come to visit when you're down and you've had something tragic happen to you but um, to cut a long story short the the, the friends kind of a saying to Job, look Job, you must have done something wrong, you must have sinned because God's punishing you, you know, there's, there's something, as, you mustn't be as righteous as you maintain you are. So <laughs> poor Job, instead of them being uplifting and comforting and they're saying, well, you deserved it, you did something wrong, didn't you? And so that goes on, there's a, there's a series of um of um, statements and things that are made by the friends. We'll come upon those in later videos. And so what happened was that it always, the conversations with Job and his friends always ended in a, you know, a brick wall, stalemate. It never, no, never went any further because Job insisted he was righteous. He hadn't done anything that he could think of that w would have uh, brought this upon him. And the friends keep saying, no, no, Job, you must be mistaken. You must have done something. Um, now, let's have another look at this. Now, um, sensible people usually understand that it is worthwhile to endure intense discomfort in pursuit of a greater goal. Now, let's use a common example. You hear these stories, these wonderful athletes that the rigorous training and hours they do to score a place on the Olympic team to represent their country or in the local football game, etc. Or we hear of people who study very hard a particular uh, profession and go on. And of course, their dedication um, can sometimes make them exceedingly um, famous, etc. depending on the field that they're in. Um, but um, so they all, are, those people who dedicate themselves to endless hours of study or physical exertion, etc., or whatever it is they're practicing or learning for, they do endure a lot of discomfort, be it sleep deprivation, physical pain, etc., etc. Um, now, if the divine wisdom decrees that one should suffer in this world, it is a small price to pay for the reward and one, our place in the world to come. Now let that sink in. We all suffer something, uh, uh, sometimes greatly, sometimes not so greatly. But aren't we better to do our suffering in this world rather than in the next? And um, I, I think that's what we have to remind ourselves at times. You know, we don't have enough of this or we have too much of that or we want that and we can't have it, you know. They're all little bits of suffering and there's a reason for that because our suffering, um, if we're doing it here in real lifetime, then we're going to be spared that in the afterlife. So we've got to realise that God um, has infinite power and he has infinite wisdom and infinite justice and mercy. So um, we have to realise, uh, like Job did, that whatever God does is good and correct and merciful uh, beyond human comprehension. Now, that's something we need to understand. The workings of God are often beyond our human um, understanding, uh, beyond our human comprehension. There are things that happen that way. But we must say, well, God knows. God knows what's best. God knows what he's doing. And this um, brings us back to this basic question. Man must be confident enough to accept and wise enough to believe. That's a very basic statement, I should say. Moses asked the same basic question of why good people suffer and bad people succeed. The sages state that this is what Moses meant when he asked, make your way known to me. Now that's in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. 
God responded that no human being could understand his way, but he would give Moses a vague glimpse. And if you read that, Exodus chapter 33, verse 13. Now, the book of Job, um, we'll talk about the authorship of this now because there's often conjecture. Uh, there's a lot of conjecture about Job the person and Job the book, and we'll come to each of those things in time. But the, uh, the authorship of uh, the book of Job, we're told by our sages of blessed memory, they attribute that to Moses. And the saying that Moses wrote this book um, and, and the book, uh, Moses wrote the Torah and also the book of Job. Now, uh, Rabino Bakaya explains that the book of Job is as basic as the Torah itself. Now, I've never heard it put that way before, but do you know what? I have had a lifelong fascination with Job. Uh, fascination at what I can't understand and fascination with what I do understand and I've never had a real in-depth sort of commentary or explanation about it which brings me to I have now acquired one so this is um uh I'll show you at the end of this video anyway I just won't break my thoughts here <laughs> and confuse myself so um so we are told that that is uh, the author of the book of job that that is moses and uh, job's friends um they uh spoke the truth that punishment that uh, sin does bring punishment and even though job has insisted that he he didn't deserve this um, but they were right in certain principles that, um, you know, when you, why are we punished, good people punished and, and bad people not. And it is an essential teaching of the book of Job, so to speak. A righteous person, they should be glad to be punished for their sins in this world in order that we are spared any suffering or decrees in the world to come. Now, Let's ask us, before we finish this video, what are the lessons for us at this point in time? Well, we can learn many practical and uplifting lessons from the ordeal and the ultimate vindication of Job. Also, Job's friends who came to comfort him, they were loyal friends, came to comfort him in distress, but instead of sympathising, they defended God and kind of accused Job of, well, you must have made a mistake, you must have sinned. Um, so it's a virtue to justify God's conduct. We should understand, no matter what it is, we uh, just as, as why was Job the subject of this physical and emotional agony? Um, and and in chapter forty two of Job, uh, you will see where God actually criticizes the friends for being insensitive to Job's um, condition, his pain and suffering. Uh, the friends meant well, but their tax tactics sort of pushed Job further into um, objectionable statements, shall we say. Now, there's something interesting here I want to mention just before we finish up, that in the Talmud, Bava Basra 16b, uh, I'm, excuse my pronunciations, I'm not linguistically gifted in, in uh, languages. A person should not be condemned for statements made at a time when he is in pain. So this means that sinners and people who misspeak shouldn't, should be admonished but it should be done in such a way that respects their feelings and will uh, uh, will accomplish the goal. Because people say things when they're in a terrible, dire situation. It's almost just, you know, the opposite to how they would normally be in the, under normal circumstances. And there's an example here where it says that um, uh, people often say things that they don't really mean. And this became, a as for an apparent heresy, some of the great Zedekim of our times freely admit that when they were trapped in the tortures of the Holocaust, they blurted out remarks they wished they had never said. 
They tell this to people who think they are hopeless sinners. No, these great men and women say, we too had crisis of faith, but we came back, so can you. And we should learn the habit of looking for the hand of God in our lives, not just the open miracles and um, the wonderful events, but in those apparent, random, unexpected events that we encounter day to day and don't even think about at times. So we must be mindful of that. Um, Hashem is present everywhere, even in what we would term unimportant events or unimportant situations. He's everywhere. He's controlling everything. Another thing to think about is, you know, over the years, Israel has been subject to many attacks. Oh, it goes on and on and on and on. If it's not from the media, it's from terrorists, etc. Um, but it, it's interesting to note that when uh, Arab and other anti-Israel states or territories have sort of been ready to move in and against um, our Jewish brothers and sisters, um, living in Israel, that is, then something happens, either an international event or there's an un, un, um, dis, uh, how shall I say, unexpected turn of events and the crisis um, doesn't take place or uh, the, the event that was unexpected or what is happening in their neck of the woods, so to speak, has forced them to abandon their... Um, their uh, fight against Israel or their, you know, um, whatever they want to do, which we, we know they're never at a loss of what they want to do to Israel, you know. They won't be happy unless they see Israel wiped, wiped off the face of the map. But there are lots of unexplained occasions that happen and we must recognise that divine providence is behind these things, even the little things just as much as the big things. We say, oh, what a miracle. It must have been from God. You know, every blade of grass that pokes through the ground and grows is a miracle from Hashem. We, to understand the large ones and the enormity of them, we first have to understand the fact that we can go to sleep at night and our heart and our lungs work on the autonomic nervous system without us even being aware of it. That, to me, as a nurse is a miracle that we live every day of our lives. And just think about that. Just think about it. I know as a nurse, the autonomic nervous system absolutely was one of my favourite topics, but also I loved it because it was just so big a thing to wrap your head around that you could be totally unaware, but your lungs and your heart would keep beating without your merest knowledge. Fascinating, isn't it? Thank you for watching. This video has been a little drawn out, I'm afraid, but never mind. Now, one thing I would like to tell you is that these, um, uh, this series on Job will continue um, one video a week, usually on a Thursday evening, Thursday night, um, or depending where you live. And um, so we will continue with this every Thursday, but I will be looking at putting up some other random videos um, also through the week, not on a regular basis, but there will be some that will crop up from time to time. So that's why it's important to press the sub subscribe button so that you know when I've released a new video. And even with the series, sometimes on a Thursday, it might necessarily be on the exact same time, um, of day, but um, please, it's important you press the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the videos. And thank you to those people who have subscribed to my channel. It is greatly appreciated. There's over 440 um, subscribers at this, about this time of this video. Um, so please subscribe, share my videos, by all means share them, leave a comment, Tick, if you like it, tick the like button. It all helps get the message out to other Noahides or like-minded people. And particularly this um, book of Job, this series, because that is a book for all times for all people. So you don't have to be a Noahide, a declared Noahide, to understand and appreciate it. So if you have friends that belong to other faiths, this may be a very interesting um 
set of videos for them to watch. So in the meantime, thank you all once again and I want you to take care and God bless.